Hi, I'm Nigel Parker. I work for Microsoft in Auckland and I'm going to spend the next half hour talking about a Windows Phone application I've built called On Sale in New Zealand. But before we get to that, I just wanted to start with a little story. This is a photo of me when I was 16 in 1993. And I remember it vividly as a eureka moment when I first got into computers. On the right here is a flatbed scanner and I remember walking into the graphic design class and seeing the new scanner in the, in the classroom scenario. For me this was a moment when I really started getting into computers. I had some physical photographs and I was amazed by the way that I could put those into the scanner and see them on a cons computer screen. This was technology that I wasn't familiar with and I was suddenly able to do things that I'd never thought I could. I could take images, I could manipulate them, I could create posters uh, with the photos that I had or morph between two people's faces like the old Michael Jackson video. If we go forward a few more years, I started university in 1995 and at the time I studied uh, computer science and psychology and philosophy. And back then there was a techn technology that was evolving which was the internet. I was able to, with four friends, uh, start a company called WebDrive which was an ability to take our skills that we were learning at university and apply them to the real world. The thing with a new technology is that at any point when a new technology comes along there's nobody who has more experience in it than the people who are willing to take the time to learn. For me it was the internet and now it's really around applications and new devices that enable that opportunity for uh, people who are, who are studying or just coming through. This book here, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. I read this book about a year ago and there were a few paragraphs in here which really resonate with me. One of these is that practice isn't the thing you do once you're good, it's the thing you do that makes you good. Quite often we forget about the fact that even experts need to learn at some point. I like the story of the guys in Finland who, uh, at, at Rovio who built Angry Birds. These guys were young guys studying who got set up into an office paid for by one of their fathers who spent a whole year building applications and building games. And it wasn't until they had countless um, misses along the way before they finally got the opportunity to build Angry Birds and deliver that to the market and have it be successful. It's another quote from the Outliers book that I come back to. Our world only allowed one 13-year-old unlimited access to a time-sharing terminal in 1968. If a million teenagers had been given the same opportunity, how many more Microsofts would we have today? This is the story of Bill Gates, who dropped out of university while he was studying to take advantage of an opportunity his father had from running a computer club. He was able to get access to computing time in the night between midnight and, the, and early hours of the morning and use that access to computers at a time when it was a scarce resource to gain experience and apply himself beyond others in the industry. There's similar stories of Steve Jobs who worked in his holiday job at HP uh, assembling computers on a conveyor belt before he went to the idea of in his garage building the Apple II or driving these things forward really comes down to three things. Right place, right time, and right opportunity. And I think right now is, uh, is there's a new breed of opportunity. It's the opportunity for mobile platforms and to create application experiences that spread across them. If you think about being a student today, in the last 6 to 12 months the world has changed dramatically. Most people have access to multiple devices. They might carry a, a phone in their pocket which gives them access to apps, cameras, um, internet throughout the day. They may have a computer at work and a computer at home and access things through other devices like tablets or TVs. And I wouldn't be surprised if in a modern society people interact with information using three or four different devices every day. What it comes down to is you really need to start with an idea. You need to have an idea of what you want to create. And then you need to think through how this idea could work. You need to refine it and develop it and then test it on your target market. I like this quote from Steve Jobs, Great Artist Ship. I couldn't agree with this more. I think once you've, uh, le once you've had a few hits under your belt or you've had a few successes, then you earn the privilege of being able to spend a long time on a project before you unleash it to the world. But if you're just starting out or you're new to a certain area, I truly believe that the quicker you ship, the more you get the, inf 
the application out there and the quicker you get feedback, uh, the better it's going to become and the more you can refine your idea. If you think, I think back into over the last eight years when I've been working with startups and uh, colleagues and people who are, who are developing software, the ones who asked me to sign an NDA uh, before that they would tell me their idea are the ones who really didn't go anywhere. The other people who had great ideas, who were willing to share them with everybody and then executed well after they gained feedback are the ones who I would look up to and respect today. So starting out I had an idea and I wanted to build my first Windows Phone 7 app but I wanted to send myself some challenges and see what I could create in only 10 hours of effort. Bearing in mind I hadn't built anything before, uh, it, it, I felt that it was quite a challenge. That said, I wanted to come up with an idea and build something that was useful that would appeal to a larger target audience and would have uh, gained quite a lot of traction. At the time, there was a huge number of daily deal sites. These were uh, turning up all over the place. And Groupon hadn't come into New Zealand yet, so the ground was pretty um, competitive. And what I was thinking was that although there was a lot of deal sites that people were interested in, there wasn't really a channel to consume this information quickly and only the stuff that was relevant to you. So there would be all these emails that would be get, get sent through and if you signed up to enough of them, you'd ignore them and wouldn't read any. So I came about the idea of aggregating these daily deal sites together and creating a mobile app to deliver them back to the user, which I called On Sale in New Zealand. So when I was starting out, I was thinking about how to build this app. And the first thing I recommend you do is to learn the basics. And when you're learning the basics, think about what it is that you want to build and what are the uh, simple labs or tutorials that are going to aid you to get there. For me, I knew I had to connect to a web service and I wanted to also display that information back on the screen inside of the phone app. So if there's a tutorial here. It's one of the very early ones from Scott Guthrie uh, for building a Windows Phone 7 Twitter application using Silverlight. And this uh, tutorial only takes about 15 minutes to walk through. And I found this is a great place to get started when I was building my first app. If I wanted to take it to another level, there was also some more in-depth hands-on labs on using the controls that come with Windows Phone, the pivot control and the panorama control, and connecting to services like Dig and Twitter and Blogger to provide that information and display it back to the user. There's a link here to an online uh, hands-on lab that can take you through using pivot and panorama. When it came to um, building my application, I chose to use a panorama control to display the information. And I'll get to it a little bit later, but maybe that wasn't the best decision. I, I didn't do enough, uh, I didn't know ab about the controls enough to determine necessarily what was going to be the right thing to use. And the other thing that I can't stress more than anything else is to build services and to build your services once and have them scale to meet the potential uh, needs of your audience. So for my example, where I was collecting all the daily deal sites, I wanted to make sure that one of the first things I did was build my service layer and build it in a way that it could scale to more applications, more uh, interfaces, more users and potentially more devices. For years I've been working with .NET and WCF for building services, but traditionally I used to create um, some quite complicated services using SOAP and these services generally are only good when you're talking .NET to .NET. The world's changed, the internet's changed, a lot of websites such as Facebook and Twitter now display um, their services and their APIs using techniques such as REST and JSON. And the good news is with .NET 4 you're actually able to take your traditional services that you've written before and dress them up using the new paradigms for REST and OAuth and, and JSON. And that's what I did when I was building my services. I also used Windows Azure to host my service. And the reason for doing this was I was able to create a, one extra small instance to host it and I could use a worker role that went along in the background to check the sites and to update on a timeline. And I could use that to serve my small user base as I was building out the app. But the platform itself, Windows Azure, gave me the ability to scale out if I needed to. So for example, if I wanted to introduce it for other countries or scale out to new platforms in large numbers of users, I could build a business model around it and then just turn on more resources as required to scale up my service layer. I was challenged when I was giving this talk in Hamilton uh, as we were talking about Grab a Seat. 
I was asked why I cached um, the data and, and I was saying that I only update my services every sort of um, 10 minutes or so. And what would happen if somebody was told that there were three seats left and they clicked through to uh, buy a deal or buy a seat on grab a seat and then all of a sudden they found out it was sold out. My feedback to that was that people expect sometimes to miss out. So if you're going through a deal site and you click it through and you know you miss out, um, it's, it's not a terrible thing to have happen because the idea of needing to build things in real time or to deliver real time information to your users is actually a scalability challenge and your services may end up not being as responsive as if you build them with a good caching strategy behind. Now let me just show you the application that I built. So this is the first version of the app uh, running inside of the Windows Phone emulator. If you see here, um, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, this was, I had my services at the back that I drew from. It loads up and these are the deals that come out for, for Auckland. So these are the current deals from Graviseat and Kudo. If I scroll down here, I see um, Grab One Escapes, Treat Me, Groupie. One day, the deal. And if I scroll across, I can see images of those particular deals. And it remembers what city you're in. But for example, if, if you are based in Wellington instead of Auckland, you could click the link and move over to Wellington. So this is the, um, the Wellington deals instead of the Auckland deals. And if I wanted to, I could click on a particular deal and it would load up inside of the web browser on the phone and I could click through and buy that particular item. So if I click that, this, this here, it'll load up in the browser and, and uh, take me to the web page. So I thought that was pretty good. And I thought the next thing I needed to do was um, ship my application, get it into the marketplace and gather some feedback. Now, if you've uh, just built an application, the tendency might be to take it to your friend or a colleague, show them the app and ask them what they think. But you're probably not going to get the honest feedback. If they don't like the app or they don't think it serves a, a particular point, they're not going to tell you because they're your friend. They're just going to sort of say, oh, yeah, it looks pretty good. But once you release an app to a marketplace, people don't hold back. They don't care that you've spent two weeks, you know, blood, sweat and tears putting uh, all your soul into creating one of these things. They're just going to get it out, look at it and see what does it mean for them. And if it doesn't hit the mark, they're going to slam you in the ratings. So I released this app. I was getting pretty excited. I started to see the downloads coming along. And I was reading these reviews and then all of a sudden, whoop, here comes a review. Doesn't support Hamilton or Dunedin. And I thought, yeah, fair enough. Um, I am only supporting Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. So that's a fair point. Yep, I get that. One out of five. Now, the next one here offended my eyes. So you think about comments and if somebody just says, yeah, app sucks, um, they're not giving you any feedback. It's just they don't like it or it doesn't work for them. But this one was interesting. It said offended my eyes. And the truth was that when I started using the app more often, I was using it every day for a couple of weeks, it was annoying. I'd realized I'd gone overboard with the panorama control. I'd put my photos in the background and they're a bit too intensive and they were taking away from the data and the information itself. So that was a little bit of feedback that I got that really sort of talked to me and told me that I needed to do something differently. So then what happened was I came along and I thought, well, it's great. But months later, I realized how I could make it better. I'd just been up to Anaheim and attended the Microsoft Build conference and seen, about, seen all the information about building Metro style apps for Windows 8. If you go to dev.windows.com, you can check out the resources and see some of the keynotes and find that experience. And a lot of things in Windows 8 have lent from Windows Phone 7, the Metro design language, the live tiles, notifications, and the things that come uh, with great apps on the phone as well. So I challenged myself and I thought, well, what would it take to build an application for more platforms. Could I extend the on sale in New Zealand app to build a version for Windows 8? And could I use the same services that I built out on Windows Azure? So if we have a look at this, if we look at my Windows Azure services, this is the um, management console for, for Windows Azure where I've got my service layer. And this is just a test deployment on a, a, an extra small instance. And this is what my services looked like for the current version, for version 1. 
it was I could search for deals in Auckland or Wellington and it would respond uh, straight away with the deals that were available for that particular city. Bearing in mind I only supported Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch at the time and they were just displayed as a long list of uh, information with not a lot of detail within them. I then came and had a look at you know, what was required to build a good tablet or a good Slate 8 in Windows 8 and I realised I needed to do a little bit more. I needed to give the user some choice about the cities that they wanted to support I'd had that feedback to say I didn't support Hamilton and Dunedin and in those eight months since there'd been a bit of work with the Daily Deal sites where they'd introduced a lot more offerings for a lot more cities around New Zealand. So what I was able to do was refine my services so that they no longer assumed that I was coming from one of the three major cities and instead they dynamically returned a list based on the cities that were currently supported by those sites. So if the sites added more cities, my service would also just pick those up and display those back as well. So I've got this dynamic listing of cities. The next thing I had was the same thing with sites. I had to extend my application to be more useful to the, to the user, but in doing that it required more effort on the server side. So what I was tracking, I had analytics, at, analytics inside of my phone app and I'd been able to determine what sites people were looking at and what links they were following as well. So I was able to uh, look across, there was, there was 450, 460 odd users in New Zealand of my Phone 7 app that were using it um, quite regularly every, every day or every few days. And I could gather from those people that these were the five sites that were most useful to them, which was Grab a Seat, Grab One, Grab One Escapes, Groupon and Groupie. So I focused my energy on improving those and took away some of the other sites with the view that I could add them back over time. And what I did was I was then able to bring back information uh, based on the city and the site that people cared about. So people could choose what sites they cared about, what cities they cared about, and then I could bring the data back just specifically for those purposes. And I went and got more information such as how many had of a thing had particular thing had been sold, how much money you were saving, um, also what city you were in, and what was the value, what was the percentage saved, what was the number bought. And by doing that inside of my, uh, my application, I also supported different formats. So if, for example, I wanted to uh, build for iOS or a, a platform like that, I could say format equals JSON um, and return JavaScript object notation. And this was the same thing that I was doing with my Windows 8 version as well. I chose to uh, write my, my interface in HTML5 and CSS and JavaScript just because I wanted to see what it would be like to use a different UI language um, as opposed to the XAML and C Sharp that I was using on the phone. Now, that's the planning for more platforms. Here you'll see the ex what, I, what I was able to create. The one at the back was the Windows 8 um, Metro style app for on sale in New Zealand. And this leveraged the new services. I could do things like grouping by the number bought or the amount of money saved or um, the site itself or the percentage saved. And then you could refine and, and define and, and break down and see the information such as that. Then after building that, I really liked what, what had come out, but I wanted to actually take another shot at my phone app as well, because my phone app was sitting there and it was looking pretty, pretty, pretty normal, you know, pretty basic compared to uh, what I'd been able to build on Windows 8. So over here, I was able to then rethink the paradigms of what it would mean uh, to build this on the mobile phone, and I created my new version, which is now in the marketplace. And if you come and have a look at this, this is the new version of On Sale in New Zealand. When it loads up, it loads up using a pivot control, which shows uh, each of the individual sites across the top. And then it shows the deals that are currently available uh, within that control. And I can drag and have a look at the particular deals. I can do things like refine and choose the particular sites that I care about and it will only show me the deals for those sites and I can do the same thing by uh, checking and choosing the only cities that I care about. So this is now useful to a person living in Hamilton um, as well as somebody living up in Auckland or Wellington or Christchurch. I can then drag across and it honours the um, theme the, and also the, the highlight colours that the person selected on their phone 
and I can go across and I can look at all these particular deals and if there's a certain deal that I want to click through I can click through and load that in my browser buy it and then come back into the app so that I learned a lot and I was able to uh, define and make a lot of changes after releasing the new version if I came back in here I could see yep the new version was working it was appealing to users there's a new review I got here great app especially after the last update could do with more sites so what that feedback is telling me is that I've done a good job they appreciate the change in the application but I've taken sites away so previously there was more sites now I'm back down to only a few so I can, if I can find some more time to bring those additional sites back in it's going to appeal more to my particular users so what about using the tools so the tools themselves are excellent for Windows Phone 7 and using Blend to give you a design view is a really good way of getting your head around um, creating or updating the design as uh, you see here. So here is the code for my on sale in New Zealand uh, project inside of Visual Studio. You notice I got to this when I created my new version. I went file new project, pivot application, and that was the basis for my version 2. I admitted that maybe Panorama wasn't the right paradigm to use, so I didn't reuse a lot of code from my first one. I actually started again with a new uh, project template. And by creating this new project template and using the pivot, I had the, the basic view model and the MVC framework to extend upon to create the new version. You'll notice here that there's an area for sample data and this sample data is really useful because it means that I can actually get back into my design objects and work inside a visual tool like um, Expression Blend. So when I go over to Expression Blend you can see that I've got these visual uh, presentations of my data bound items and it's coming from my sample data. So if I select my pivot here I can then drill in on the template so I can look at the um, the generated item template and then I can look at the list box that I'm displaying uh, my particular items in and I can come down in here and look at my current list box and I can see the structure that's being displayed and shown back to the user and if I wanted to make some changes I could select a particular item there's the test data in it and I could do things like increasing the font size if I increase the font size there you'll see the change happening in real time and you can see how that applies back to the template that you're developing so there's similar tools coming with Windows 8 for um, expression blend 5 for doing the same sort of work using CSS and HTML as I'm using here with with Silverlight and XAML so it's a great way of actually creating the capability without um, needing to hand code it or, or, or learn how to do it um, you know natively using something like notepad so the other thing I, I thought I'd mention here is that this example of on sale in New Zealand started as an idea it was refined I built a version 1 which I was proud of at the time but was turned out to be you know not great um, but the idea and the problem that I was trying to solve was validated by my user base I then had another opportunity to build for a new platform. I extended my service layer. I built for the new platform using a new project technology, which was HTML5 and CSS. And then I learned from that and went back to my original phone app and extended and built that app to be more relevant to the audience and the users that I was um, targeting for or who were working with my app. This, all these learnings could be applied and then you could be expanded to take this to new markets and developed in new ways. This book here, We Are All Weird by Seth Godin, I read this on the plane when I was coming back from Singapore last week. And I also was inspired by this book and I found it an excellent observation of how we are changing and how technology is changing us, our ability to reach new audiences. Seth does a great job of capt captivating and capitalizing on the here and the now. And this book was only written a couple of months ago, so it's really fresh and it creates some great insights. He's got a quote in this book that resonates with me. Mobile rewards right here, right now, all about me thinking. The marketer has no choice but to surrender all pretense to mass. So what this means is that a person standing at a bus stop with a mobile phone in their pocket will pull their phone out to load an app that serves them with what they want 
in that place and time that they're using it. If it doesn't meet those requirements, they won't do it. They'll, they'll try it once and never try it again, or they'll move on and find something else that does. Back in the day, you used to have three TV channels, a million people watching, and a TV advertisement that would reach those million. It was a one-size-fits-all model because we didn't have as much choice as we do right uh, here and now. And this explosion of choice and variation sets us free to spin and gamble at random, getting weirder at every turn. And what this means for me is when I was going through the on-sale in New Zealand app, I was able to refine it to be more um, to serve the needs of my users more intent intently. If I wanted to take it to another level, I could use the location on the phone. Uh, so when the first first time the user runs it, I will set it accordingly to the appropriate um, cities and then lead them to update that if they wanted to make changes. It's about uh, meeting users' requirements and not necessarily meeting your own requirements. You can be rewarded by delivering something for an audience, uh, which is a group of people or a tribe that have different points of view. And the, and the more choices that are there, the weirder people become. But if a group of people will buy your application, they will then generally have it validated by similar people with similar tastes. So thank you for listening to this quick presentation and I encourage you to go and take a look at um, create.msdn.com if you're interested in about building mobile phone apps for Windows Phone 7 or dev.windows.com if you're looking at Windows 8. And this is my details if you want to follow me on, uh, check out my blog, uh, follow me on Twitter, have a chat, you're welcome to come along and, and start a conversation. Thank you very much.